Every year we get to make choices of where we put our money, what companies we invest in, and where we think our money will work the hardest. In my portfolio, I put my money to work in what I believe are the best companies in the world. These companies are compounders that continually grow their intrinsic value over time. Since I only hold 11 companies total, I can be selective. I can be concentrated. I buy only the companies in which I believe will have the best returns. And in this episode, we'll be going over five of them. My five favorite stocks for 2024. Not only are each of these companies incredible in their own right, but they all have unique catalysts that should help them perform well next year. Let's start off with number one. We have it in the real estate category. The company's called Vici, a real estate investment trust. Vici has been a winning position. I'm currently in the green by $8,485, but these gains came from 2022 and 2021. They did not come from 2023. So far this year, the S&P 500 is up a staggering 21%. That is a great year for the stock market, but some companies have been left out of this rally. For example, while the market's up 21%, Vici's currently down minus 3.43% year to date. So it's going down in price as the rest of the market's going up. Now, if we factor in dividends to the total return, with dividends included, Vici's return is basically flat for the year. But keep in mind, this is a flat return with the S&P 500 up 21%. The relative underperformance has been wide this year. And this relative underperformance is not just Vici, it's the entire REIT sector. Real estate investment trusts have not done well this year. We can take Realty Income Corp, for example. Realty Income Corp is down a staggering 14%, while again, the market is in the green big time. So even with dividends included, this is dramatic underperformance. And there's a reason why these companies are underperforming. That reason is simple. The federal funds rate has gone up all of 2023. It's no secret that the federal funds rate has risen dramatically over the past two years. In fact, it went up from basically zero in 2022 to now above 5%. A big part of what makes investments like Vici and other real estate investment trusts attractive investments are their stable cash flow payout through their dividend. The dividend yield you can be paid by investing in the company today is 5.4%. So we have this nice 5.4% dividend yield from Vici. You get that paid to you every single quarter. Well, with the interest rates going up, now banks can offer yields on savings accounts that are roughly the same. And one, for example, offers a 5% high yield savings account. With the rise in interest rates, other banks like SoFi offer up to 4.6%, again, an insured savings account. So now with interest rates a bit higher, investors have more choices of what to do with their money to get current yield. A lot of investors that would be investing in companies like Vici for that nice 5.4% dividend yield are instead saying, you know what, I'll invest in this savings account. I'll invest in this money market account where my money's insured and I'm not taking on the single stock risk of investing in a company like Vici. Now, because of this relative attractiveness of savings accounts, the price from funds from operation, which is basically like the PE ratio for REITs, well, this has compressed as a result of investors having more opportunities with their cash. It went from a 17 funds from operation down to a 13. So you have multiple compression happening this year. That multiple compression is what has caused Vici's stock price to remain stagnant even though the company's growing its earnings power. Vici's stock price is going down as their cash flows are going up. All of this is a result of multiple compression. Well, it's not difficult to believe that because interest rates went up, causing multiple compression, it'll have the reverse effect when interest rates inevitably go back down. If interest rates were to start dropping, these banks could no longer offer their 5% APY savings. It would go down to 4.5%, and then 4%, and then 3%. But Vici's yield would stay the same, a 5.4% yield starting. And of course, the relative difference in yield between Vici and savings accounts would widen over time, causing Vici to be relatively more attractive the further rates fall. Now you can make whatever prediction you want about the economy or whatever direction you think rates will go. There's many people predicting that rates will stay higher for longer. We have articles from Barron saying that higher interest rates are here to stay. So in the worst case scenario for Vici, interest rates stay the same. In that case, there's likely not gonna be much more multiple compression. We just won't see much multiple expansion. And if the multiples remain exactly how they are today, Vici should grow right along with their earnings growth. 
which would mean that they still have a decent year in 2024. So even in this scenario that interest rates hang around where they are today, I don't see much more downside for Vici. But that of course is not the only scenario. There is of course the option that the Fed begins to cut rates in 2024. I think they're going to cut rates, and uh, you know, I think they're going to cut rates sooner than people expect. Pretty soon. So you know, I think the market expects sometime middle of next year. I think it's more likely probably as early as Q1. Bill Ackman is predicting that the Fed will be forced to cut interest rates early next year. And this isn't off the cuff. This isn't said in jest. He has actually positioned his portfolio on this happening. He is buying specific positions that will benefit from an interest rate cut. In this scenario that we start to see interest rate cuts sooner than expected, companies like Vici will benefit from the relative value of savings accounts and money market accounts going down. Vici will also benefit again from not having to refinance debt at a higher interest rate cost. So Vici's cost of capital will go down as a result. Interest rates going down has a dual benefiting effect for Vici. Not only will Vici benefit that way, but the company itself also owns prized assets that are becoming more valuable every single year. We have a video from Marcus Brownlee going over him taking a trip to Vegas and watching Formula One. He was incredibly impressed by the event itself and the atmosphere in Vegas. Vegas has successfully transitioned from becoming just a place to go and gamble and have fun at casinos to now an event center of the world, a place where you not only go for conventions, but you go for sports, for Formula One events, for concerts, for every type of entertainment event you can think of. The underlying assets which own all of these properties should become more attractive as well. So because of the low valuation, compressed multiple, likelihood of interest rates going down, and the success of Vegas diversification vacation, I believe Vici Properties is currently positioned to have a great 2024. Now moving on to number two, we have Netflix. Yes, Netflix. I do not hold Netflix in my primary portfolio. I hold it in a portfolio I have called the Story Fund. This is my secondary, smaller, tech-focused portfolio. Netflix is a company that I've been investing in for a while, and it's been a bit of a wild ride. I currently have a $43,000 position, which is slightly in the green. And Netflix is a company that has strong positioning for 2024. Before we go into this one, I want you to first remove all biases you have about Netflix, all preferences you have about the company or their content. When we're doing analysis on companies, it should be based on factual objective circumstances of the business itself, not your own personal preferences and what type of content you like. With Netflix, there are many facts revolving around this company that set it up really well for 2024. One of those facts is Netflix just raised prices. After the company raises prices, typically you see a little bit of churn. That's some people leaving and moving to either a lower subscription or canceling their service. But in the case of Netflix, they did this intelligently. They came out with an ad tier subscription that was at a lower price range. So instead of people completely leaving the service, they simply just joined the ad tier which wouldn't you know, the ad tier has about the same average revenue per month as the higher price tiers. So this price raise from Netflix has an overwhelmingly accretive net benefit to their revenue. Netflix's revenue is expected to accelerate in 2024, not decelerate. It's going to go from 6.38% all the way up to 14%. So we're seeing the revenue speed up notably from one year to the next, and analysts are now predicting that Netflix is going to have multiple years of double-digit revenue growth. It's difficult for companies to go down in stock price as they're re-accelerating revenue to double digits. That can happen, but it usually doesn't, because investors look very positively on companies that can re-accelerate revenue back to higher speeds. That typically means that the company deserves a higher multiple. The next fact about Netflix is the password crackdown is working. In fact, it's almost working too well. A lot of people did not expect them to be able to crack down on users sharing passwords and have this little of blowback. Not only are people not canceling, but they're seeing a huge net increase of subscribers. Last quarter, Netflix gained a staggering 9 million subscribers in the quarter. 9 million is far above their typical rate. And a lot of those additional subscribers in the previous quarter were a result of the password crackdowns. Next quarter, Netflix is also predicting, well, about the same. They're predicting roughly the same amount, give or take a million. So not only did they have a blowout quarter last quarter, but for Q4, they're expecting roughly the same in total of net ads. 
It's difficult to imagine Netflix going down in value as they gain 18 million net subscribers over a six month period. And one thing that people are forgetting is that the password crackdown isn't even complete. There's a lot of users that still haven't received that notice that they can no longer share accounts. Netflix is rolling this out gradually over time. So we're gonna see continued quarters of more and more people joining with their own individual accounts. The next fact about Netflix is the ad tears growing much quicker than expected. It's already gained 15 million subscribers just on the ad tier alone. Now with advertising, scale is incredibly important. So the faster this tier grows, the more attractive it becomes to advertisers, especially large blue chip advertisers. Netflix is looked at as a very attractive place to advertise because of the viewership, because of the engagement, and because they know what content is on their service. Their RPM rates, or the rate that they can charge charge advertisers per 1,000 views is much higher than other services. So Netflix's ad supported tier is another valuable part of the company that's growing like a weed. Now there's more positives for Netflix going into 2024. The writers and actors strike have both been resolved. They're back to making content. They have found a way to make sports related content without paying the billions of dollars of sports licensing. For example, next year they're having a live tennis match between two of the highest rated tennis pros. Other streaming services are finally capitulating in their competition with Netflix. Disney, for example, just agreed to license 14 shows to Netflix in 2024 and 2025, including This Is Us, Prison Break, Lost, Archer, and How I Met Your Mother. All of these key Disney-owned shows are going on to Netflix. And Netflix's growth and free cash flow is expected to continue. In 2023, Netflix will have generated $6 billion in free cash flow, proving that with the right scale, this business model can work. And management has said repeatedly that they still expect to generate significant cash flows in 2024. So because of the accelerated revenue growth, the consistent cash flow generation, the huge expected net increase in subscribers and ad tier, I believe there's a lot of upside for Netflix. Even though Netflix performed well in 2023, I expect that performance to continue into 2024. Moving on to number three, we have cost the warehouse company. Costco is one of the OG holdings of my portfolio. I've invested in this company since day one of investing back in 2017. Currently, it stands at 10% of my portfolio with $54,000 total position, 17,400 in the green. There's a lot of investors that may believe now is not the time to buy Costco or hold the company at all. After all, Costco's stock price just recently rose by 37%. This year, it's had incredible outperformance over the S&P 500. And while the stock price has risen, Costco's multiple has also risen as well. The P.E. ratio now stands at a staggering 39 multiple. That is a very high P.E. ratio even for Costco. So I understand the argument of not wanting to own Costco with this valuation and believing that there's other more attractive investments. You might even believe that a lot of other retailers are more attractive. I believe those arguments in most cases are wrong. In the fullness of time, Costco has repeatedly proven to be a superior investment to other cheaper alternatives. Why does this keep happening? Why is Costco always more expensive, but always a better investment? Well, I believe there's a couple reasons behind this. The first thing is that PE ratios are based on the consensus analyst estimates of the next 12 months of earnings. They combine all the top bank analysts and whatever they average out to, that's what they believe Costco will earn. The truth is that in most cases, reality looks a lot different than what the analysts expect. Costco in many cases continues to earn more for longer, faster than what analysts expect and I believe they will in the future. Another thing that's tricky with Costco is the valuation of the company itself. A lot of people are hyper-focused on the P.E. ratio of the company, which is that next 12 months annual estimates of the earnings per share. But if we look at it on a free cash flow basis, the company trades above a 2% free cash flow yield. That's a bit less expensive on a cash flow basis. And when you factor in different nuances with this valuation, it even looks more attractive. Costco, for example, has no working capital. They don't have any working capital because they're one of the rare retailers that turns over their merchandise so fast that they actually sell the merchandise before they even pay the supplier for it. And while they have fast turnover, there's other things that make Costco look artificially more expensive than it is. For example, if we compare Costco to BJ's Wholesale Club, this company looks a lot cheaper on an earnings basis. That is because of a couple different reasons. One of the reasons that BJ's Wholesale Club looks much cheaper is because they spend less money on CapEx. But the reasons that they spend less money on CapEx is because they are renting out their warehouses and they're leasing the land in which those warehouses sit on. 
so they have rent expense instead of owning the properties outright. Costco lays out the cash in advance and buys the land and the warehouses that their business operates from. They pay more in advance and upfront, lowering their future earnings over the next 12 months, but they believe that this is a beneficial payoff in the long term. This investment of owning this key land in every single city and neighborhood pays them back in dividends because of their lowered interest expense from constant rent raises. It also is an appreciating asset that gains value over time as the properties they buy develop over time, with more and more homes and neighborhoods moving in. So Costco has an appreciating asset and lower long-term expense, but in the meantime, their business looks more expensive because they're laying out more cash. If Costco, for example, was to hypothetically transfer over to the business model of BJ's Wholesale Club and lease all of their land, the company would instantly become cheaper on an earnings basis just by making that decision, but they know it's a worse decision in the long term, so they won't do it. Another reason that I believe Costco is worth it even at this high price is because I believe it's one of the companies that is truly one of a kind. There is no other company that's like Costco. For example, look at Costco's average revenue per warehouse compared to Sam's Club. Sam's Club is their next closest competitor, and Costco is crushing them, over doubling the amount of revenue per warehouse. And this is while Costco's opening up more warehouses than Sam's Club. Sam's Club has basically stalled in the amount of warehouses they're opening, while Costco opens up 25 more every single year. Costco's executive membership, which is their higher earning members that spend more in the warehouse, has grown dramatically over the years and sees rapid accelerated growth year after year. These members have a very low churn rate. They are satisfied with their membership. They keep it year after year after year. Costco's expanding both domestically and internationally. They're opening up some of their biggest warehouses in the world. In fact, one that's going to go in Fresno, California is going to be their largest warehouse ever. Not only are they expanding, but they're making their new expansions even bigger. Another big catalyst that could happen in 2024 has to do with how they earn their money. We can look at the net income for Costco over time. Now, the net income is just one number of how much profit the company earned on that calendar year. But if we broke up the net income, there would be two basic categories. There'd be the category that they earn from their sales minus the cost. This is simply how most retailers operate. They buy merchandise and then they sell that merchandise for a higher price to the customer. They earn net income, which is the difference between the price of what they pay and what they sell. This is what most retailers like Walmart and Target and Dollar General are focused on, the margin between the price of the items they sell. Costco makes money this way, but it makes up for roughly 60 to 70% of their net income. Costco is unique in that they have another huge portion of their net income that is made from their membership price. Their membership that's charged every year to every customer makes up for a huge chunk of their total earnings. And one thing that Costco has not done for years and years is raise the price of their membership. In fact, the last membership price increase took place in 2017. This is six years ago that they haven't raised the price. Costco was recently asked whether or not they will raise the price again in the future. And they say it's a matter of when, not if. I believe Costco could raise the price of their membership at any point in time. They have enough goodwill with customers. They offer enough value. They have enough loyalty. They could raise the prices by 20, 30, or 40%, and almost every Costco member would continue to pay that increase in price. They would do so because they enjoy the membership that much. If Costco raised prices on the membership, the membership would instantly be accretive to their net income and raising their profits dramatically. Now, of course, analysts don't know when this is gonna happen, so they don't know when to bake this into the earnings projections. But if Costco raised the price any time over the next two years, the company should see a big increase in their earnings, therefore dropping their multiple, making the company cheaper than it appears. With the combination of long overdue pricing power, customer goodwill, and Costco being a fortress stock that's looked to for protection against uncertain times, I believe this company is still continually set up for a good 2024. 
As investors continue to realize that Costco is unique from other retailers, that it is one of a kind and it's a prized asset, more investors will be drawn to this company. In number four, we have S&P Global. S&P Global is my largest position in my portfolio with a total value of $78,700, $12,500 in the green currently. Now, S&P Global is a company that has also recently had good performance. In 2023 so far, year to date, it's up 26%, so it's right there a little bit above the market, holding up just fine. But if we zoom out a little bit, S&P Global actually is below its all-time highs, which happened in 2021. And since then, it's simply traded down and traded around. So what's happened over the past couple of years? Well, we can look and see. S&P Global recently went through a major acquisition. You can see this in their financials. For example, we can see over the past couple of years, their organic growth of their different product lines growing over time. And then suddenly in 2021, and then into 2022, their revenue grew by around 30% immediately. This is the result of an acquisition. The company that they acquired was called IHS Market. We have this information saved in Qualtrim, but we can look at the financials of what this company used to be before it was acquired. We look at revenue growth and IHS Market had decent revenue growth, growing around 10% for the past decade. IHS Market was a very profitable company. In fact, the EBITDA was growing dramatically faster than the revenue. They were growing in their free cash flow. Their free cash flow per share was also growing as they were able to keep their stock-based comp mostly flat while growing those cash flows and they grew dramatically in net income and earnings per share. IHS Market was a good company. S&P Global bought this good company. They integrated it into their company, and they made IHS Market even better by selling off the lower performing assets, like the engineering division. Now, even though the overall acquisition is accretive and it's good for the company in the long term, in the short term, it makes things a little bit less predictable. For example, the shares outstanding had a jump up to pay for IHS Market, Investors do not like when they get diluted and when there's new shares issued. The balance sheet also took a hit. We can see the long history of S&P Global having more cash than debt, or at least having them close. But if we look over the past five years, we can see that the cash went down and the debt has gone up immediately to pay for IHS market. Of course, investors didn't like this as well. So as this merging of two companies has been anticipated and taken effect, the stock price of S&P Global has taken a hit as a result. Investors are looking for clarity. They're looking for this merger to be worked through and for S&P Global to be on a better path of profitability, paying down debt and reducing shares outstanding. And that's exactly what's happening now. Even though S&P Global is up 26% this year, I believe it has further catalysts for 2024. One of those catalysts is debt issuance. As companies issue more debt in 2024 than they did in 2023, S&P Global will rate that debt and their cash flows will increase as a result. S&P Global is projecting $4.1 billion in free cash flow in 2023 and incremental cash flow growth in 2024. This is back on track. It's the company growing its bottom line and top line at the same time. They've also stated that they now have a very clear buyback program. They'll continually be buying back shares every chance they get. There's nothing exciting about S&P Global's business model other than it's highly profitable and highly consistent. They will sell more data. Data is becoming more valuable over time. They will include AI capabilities in everything they're doing with their business. The global markets continue to grow with activity and new entrants every single year, bringing more and more capital under their indice business. Over time, debts continue to grow. S&P Global rates the majority of that debt. And with the IHS market transaction firmly behind them and a clear path ahead, I see more predictable gains with this company in the future. So it's one that I believe will have a very strong 2024. Now finally we get to pick number 5, which is Canadian Pacific. This is a company that I'm excited about for 2024. I own a bit of Canadian Pacific. I bought into the company this year. The current value is at $30,500, and I'm currently in the red by $1,500. Right now, Canadian Pacific is actually the only company that I'm currently in the red on. So this one has been a bit of a drag so far. Like S&P Global, Canadian Pacific has gone through a recent acquisition. They've purchased a company called Kansas City Southern, which is another railroad company. Now I won't get into the background and all the technicals of this transaction, but to summarize it, it basically extends their rail all the way from Canada across the US into Mexico. And having one company have access to three different countries through rail is a pretty big advantage. 
So during the transaction, that was a major selling point, and it gives them a lot of strategic advantages over the competition. But you know how transactions work. Typically, they have a short-term impact on the stock, and it did so in this case as well. This year, Canadian Pacific is down 2% year-to-date, and it's basically been like this, trading around flat the entire year. In fact, this is another one of those stocks that's high quality, but it really hasn't gone anywhere since 2021. So what we're seeing here is a long, drawn-out period of zero returns for Canadian Pacific shareholders. And this is often the case of how these compounders work. They go through long, drawn-out stretches of no returns, and then suddenly they have a big lift in returns over a short period of time. So I believe investors buying into this stock right now, forming a position, and waiting patiently will eventually be rewarded. Now, Canadian Pacific does have a couple key catalysts in the future. One of them is the expected reacceleration of earnings per share growth. With this acquisition in 2023, the earnings per share were basically flat on the year. In fact, they were down a little bit. But in 2024, they're expected to reaccelerate back to 17%. And then the following following year almost 19%. In fact, Canadian Pacific is expected to have high teens earning per share growth for the next three years. Now, the incredible thing is typically a company that's growing earnings per share and growing revenue also has growing expenses and capex. But in this case, Canadian Pacific is saying that their expenses are going to be flat or down. They just released an investor presentation this December. So this is as recent as this month. And they have on this presentation that they are expecting flat capex from 2023 to 2028 in the range of 2.6 to 2.8 billion. This means that during all of those years of earnings per share growth and revenue growth, their expenses are remaining flat, creating more operating leverage for the business. While they're also forecasting flat expenses, they believe that their leverage ratio is going to go down from where it stands right now at 3.6, which is a bit high, to 2.5, which is well into a comfortable range. These are very attractive forecasts for a company. We're gonna see earnings per share go up, revenue go up, CapEx stay flat, leverage ratios go down. Basically every part of the business is improving in the right direction at a pretty brisk pace. Now a company with this type of expected growth and improvement in every metric, you'd expect it to be very expensive, but that's not the case with Canadian Pacific. It currently trades in the low 20s PE ratio. The free cash flow yields currently at 3%. I don't consider these metrics to be this expensive for a company of this quality and this expected growth. If we look further at their financial projections and we combine both their expectations for capex and their growth, growth, it implies a free cash flow per share growth of roughly 20% per year for the next five years. Now that seems very aggressive, but that is in line with their history. They've averaged out 19% for the past five years, which is very fast. This is as fast as some big tech companies. Now, of course, future projections are always a bit uncertain, and we could have a situation where the management is just saying a lot of things that aren't really true. That does happen with some companies. But in this case, the CEO of the company is a very trustworthy person. He's ran railroads for a very long period of time. He has hour long interviews on YouTube where he goes through in detail the business, the operations, the safety, the synergy, everything that he's doing to try to make this railroad better. He strikes me as a very knowledgeable, honest, hardworking, and skilled railroad operator. So Canadian Pacific is one of these rare situations where you have a company that's pretty high quality, not perfect, but it's pretty good. It trades at a reasonable valuation, it has very high growth expectations, and it has competent and trustworthy management. For those reasons, I believe the company's set up to have a great 2024. So there you have my five favorite companies for 2024. Let me know if you agree or disagree, or what are your favorites. I'll also be following up on this, showing you what happens over time, and showing you transparently how my portfolio does. So if you like this type of content, make sure to subscribe to the channel and ring the little bell notification so you get updates whenever I upload. That's all for now. See you in the next one.